Hello everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. Today we're going to be repairing this issue 6A Spectrum 48K. I've been doing a pretty good job of getting through all of these speckies I've got in a box under the desk, and this one proved to be a tough customer, so let's see how it went. First things first, we disconnect the RF modulator box and put this 100 microfarad 16 volt capacitor in to enable the composite video output. I'm going to plug it straight in because I have a current limiting power supply, and yep, that is totally foobar. The current draw isn't off the scale at least, so I'm going to start by checking the voltages. All of the voltages can be found at the lower RAM, but I'm going to start by checking the 5 volt output of the regulator. That's looking good to me, so let's head to the lower RAM and check for the plus 12 volts and the minus 5 volts. Let's go anti-clockwise from the top left. The voltages are always in the corners of these chips, so minus 5 volts is broken. Plus 12 volts is broken, and 5 volts we know is working, if I can get this probe to make a good contact. There it is. So that tells me that there's a problem in the power circuit. Let's take a quick look at an issue 6A power circuit schematic. We can mark up what we know. The plus 5 volts line is good. The plus 12 volts line is not good. I'll use red, because red is bad and also the minus 5 volts is not good and that is down here in the bottom right. Now we don't need to go into too much detail here because we know that TR4 and usually TR5 are the culprits when the power circuit goes bad that's these two transistors here. So I'm basically going to replace those and I'm fairly confident that will restore our voltages. We can do a quick check by probing the collector leg of TR4 where it should be oscillating between something like 0 and at least 12-13 volts and um, it's not going to be because our voltages are bad. Here are our two culprits, TF4 and TF5, and we're going to desolder these and replace them if I had any spares. So fast forward, I ordered some spares, they arrived, and here they are. I got myself some screws as well, for good measure, because my cat keeps knocking the screws off the desk and under the floorboards. The new transistors we're going to be using are ZTX751 and ZTX651, TR5 on the Speccy is replaced by the 751 and TR4 is replaced by the 651. And as promised, let's take a look at the collector of TR4 in its current state and we will see that it's not oscillating between 0 and some voltage. It is flat at about 8.5 volts. Totally knackered. You can just cut these out and remove the legs, but I'm going to desolder them and remove them in one piece uh, using my brand new shiny green metal solder sucker and it's off to the graveyard for these two guys. And before putting the new ones in, I'm going to be good and clean up any excess solder around these joints. Copper braid works wonderfully for this. So let's poke in TR4 and TR5 and solder in the replacements. If you wanted to be really neat, you could use pliers to bend the legs so that they are vertical going into the joints, but you can just kind of poke them in. And once that's all sealed up, we'll cut the excess off the legs and power it up, see what happens. And without even looking at the screen, we can see that it's drawing 1 amp, which is way too much. I'd expect somewhere between 0.6 and 0.7 amps for a specy with one of these regulators on, so something's wrong. What I suspect has happened is the voltages are all good, which you'll see here they are, but whatever has destroyed our power circuit also destroyed a chip or two, and now that the voltages are restored, those chips are likely drawing too much current because of shorts. Unfortunately, the nature of the failure meant I couldn't just plug a diagnostic cartridge in the back, so I'm going to have to socket the ROM chip and plug in an EEPROM, which has been flashed with a diagnostic ROM image. And I'm being very good again and using the copper braid to soak up excess solder from the top of these joints to make sure I don't pull any traces up when I remove the chip. In fact, I've been finding that doing this actually makes the whole process quicker on average and, yeah, much less likely to damage the board. Here's our nice new replacement socket. And when soldering a chip or a socket, I always tack two opposing corners and check that it's sitting flush. If it's not flush, you can just heat those corners in turn while pushing on the chip or the socket, being careful not to burn your finger, and it will be flush to the board nice and neat. There we are, looking good, and here's our EEPROM, which we burned in a previous video. With any luck, this is going to tell us what's wrong. And it's telling us that all of the lower RAM chips have failed, that's not good. 
and we have one failed upper RAM chip so I'm going to ignore the fact that all the lower RAM chips are failed because I don't know what to do about that and start by replacing IC18. Enter the shiny new green solder sucker and what we're going to do is continue ignoring the fact that all of the lower RAM chips aren't working and plug in this new upper RAM chip and hope it solves all of our problems. That's looking neat, nice and flush to the board. Here's the new chip. Thank you Retroleum for always having these in stock for me. And let's see what happens with our diagnostic ROM still plugged in. Well that's disappointing, we still have complete lower RAM failure, but the upper RAM passed the test, so that's good. I still need to recap it, so I'm going to do that while ignoring the lower RAM failure and hope it goes away. There's our shiny new capacitors in place. But unfortunately it hasn't resolved the issue. We're going to have to look at the instructions, or the schematic at least. Let's start by marking up what we know. The lower RAM, well I don't believe all of the lower RAM has failed, maybe one or two has, but not in a way that makes the ROM think all of them has failed, so I'm going to start by looking at the ULA. It's not the most likely culprit, but it is one of the easiest to check, because I have a spare and it's socketed. It is wise to use replacement ULAs which suit the board, and this is actually an early ULA, it's probably not suitable for this board. It should at least tell us if the ULA is causing this error with the lower RAM, and as you saw there we still had the same error, so I'm pretty confident that the ULA in this machine is not broken, mainly because it's producing an image, so I'm going to mark that green. So what else on this schematic can we see is directly connected to lower RAM, well the ROM connects to the address in the data bus, so that's probably a good candidate, but I did try replacement ROM and still had the same error. So what about the Z80? The Z80 is connected to the data bus and the address bus. I'm not convinced it's causing the problem because it's running the ROM code, but anyway there's no harm in taking it out, socketing it and trying a replacement. As you can see we did a pretty good job of socketing this chip. I've got some replacements at 80 so let's pop one in see what happens. 10 points if you can name the movie that's playing in the background there. Unfortunately that didn't work but at least we can mark it off as green. But here's an idea. The RAS and CAS signals are critical for the timing of addressing the lower RAM. If there's a problem with those then all of the lower RAM chips would be failing. And as you see in the schematic, the RAS and CAS signals from the ULA are going through these link leads and this 74LS04 chip. Out of interest, let's mark the schematic up with the configuration of our board's link leads. I'll put those in blue. And now let's trace where our RAS and CAS signals go, starting with RAS. Well, that goes directly to the lower RAM and then off to the ZX8401 via the 74LS04 chip and our CAS signal actually just goes directly through a link to the lower RAM. Well as I'm running out of ideas I'm going to replace that chip anyway and see if it makes a difference. This wasn't as easy to get hold of as the replacement upper memory chip but I found some and I ordered a few just in case I needed any in future. Cue the shiny green solder sucker and for some reason I had to do a lot of poking around the legs of this chip. I got the copper braid out again to try and soak up excess solder and just had to really work it for a lot longer than the other chips before it finally came out. And just to be extra careful I just visually checked the continuity from the joints to the surrounding traces, making sure to do that on both sides of the board, placing the new chip in and finally sealing it up. So did it work? No. So that really only leaves us with the ZX8401 as the last major chip to test. So I do have some spares, I have some sockets too, I removed that, put in a spare, and it was still broken. Which only really leaves the lower RAM to check, but I really don't believe they could all have failed like that in such a way that a diagnostic ROM is still able to run. And as much as it pains me, I'm going to have to replace it. I've had this lower RAM replacement board in a drawer for a long time now, so finally this seems like a good opportunity to use it. So here it is, fitted and we can run the diagnostic ROM again and see what we get. And what do we get? Complete lower RAM failure. Alright, let's do some continuity testing, but what shall we test? Everything! Let's just test all of the continuity, and it's all good, of course. Microscope comes out next, and I did find some rough looking solder joints that had holes in them. Here's a little gallery of the holy solder joints. 
saying that none of them looked in any kind of a state that would cause the issue that we're seeing, although it can't hurt to reflow them, so let's do that. While I was reflowing these solder joints, which didn't work by the way, I did have a thought. What if I removed the ROM chip entirely and ran a diagnostic ROM from the edge connector? This should eliminate any funny business with the ROM socket and the ROM chip itself. And hey look, it's working, look at those beautiful colours, I've never been so happy to see them. Trying really hard to ignore the fact that I didn't need to remove all of those lower RAM chips, let's continue with some continuity testing around the ROM chip socket because there's clearly something going on. I didn't find any issues so I plugged a chip in and did the same test but testing continuity from the leg of the chip itself just to make sure that there was a connection between the chip and the board via the socket. And in doing so my attention was drawn to these ROM link leads which I've never had to do anything with before and it turns out that's just pure luck. These are actually really important because they route the signals from the CPU and the ULA to the correct pins on the ROM chip and the purpose of the pins involved is to remove the ROM chip from the data bus when it's not supposed to be on there. So if these are configured incorrectly for the type of ROM chip you've plugged in, the ROM is going to be on the data bus while the other chips are trying to access it and you're gonna have a bad time. Let's demonstrate by doing the same thing again. We'll mark on the schematic the links that this board has, which is the N links uh, for the NEC style chips as opposed to the Hitachi style chips which means the ULA's ROM chip select signal is being routed to pin 27, which is wrong, the EEPROM I plugged in expects that on pin 20. This is very likely the cause of the entire lower RAM failure that we were seeing when the ROM was trying to run. So as you can see, I've taken out those links and I'm going to reattach them in the H positions. I've plugged in a spare Hitachi style ROM chip and let's see if it works, drum roll please. Hey, finally, it's working. So all that was wrong with this in the end was we had a Duff ROM chip and a Duff upper RAM chip. That's it. When I first tested the ROM right at the beginning I must have plugged in a Hitachi style chip without changing those two link leads. And from that point on I just had an EEPROM in which was a Hitachi style pinning and that's why the diagnostic ROM wouldn't run properly. There was actually nothing wrong with the machine at that point. I'm actually repairing a board right now with an NEC style ROM chip in, so I'm going to socket that and try the EEPROM in there and see if we still get the complete lower RAM failure just to confirm the theory. So keep an eye out for that update and thank you for watching, please like and subscribe.